Hello everyone, I'm Norman Walberger. Today we're carrying on with this new approach, box arithmetic, where we are trying to put the duality between objects and anti-objects sort of foremost in our arithmetic. So this is a very novel approach to, uh, to arithmetic because it's really building on a 20th century physics understanding discovery, that of the fundamental duality between particles and antiparticles in our sort of subatomic world, which is really a remarkable uh, development in 20th century physics and really ought to rank up there with relativity and quantum mechanics uh, in terms of just the significance of it. So what we're going to do today is to proceed by more or less concentrating on notation, nomenclature. I'm going to introduce variants to the things that I've already been talking about, sort of now with this view of trying to put this duality uh, center stage for us. Okay, so roughly what we're going to do is if we have some object, okay, then the anti-object will be denoted by a hyphen object. That's our general orientation, okay, that will be um, used quite frequently. And Correspondingly, when we want to talk about both these objects, whatever they are, and the anti-objects together, I propose to include them in a, a bigger sort of category or classification by using a capital, so in this case, capital O object, okay? So a capital O object will include both these little O objects and their anti-objects. So that's just a very general kind of thing. So let's see how it works for these um, these boxes and, and the arithmetic of them. So the basic idea is that we're going to build up arithmetic using boxes. And now centrally, crucially, we are going to suppose that we have two different kinds of boxes, black boxes and red boxes. Okay, not just one. We have two different kinds. And these are somehow opposite or antis of each other. So we'll agree that the black ones are to be denoted by boxes. These are the boxes. And the anti-objects, or A boxes, will be denoted in red. So if we have some box with something inside it, let's say it's the box called B, and then we consider a very identical box which has the same things inside it, but now has a red boundary instead of a black boundary, then we'll refer to this as B super A, or the anti of B. Okay, Now, both these little B boxes and the A little B boxes are included in the broader classification of capital B boxes. Okay, So when we write a capital B, then we're referring to both objects in black as well as their anti-objects in red. Okay, so... To start the story, we look at the simplest kind of boxes, which are the zero boxes. But now there is two of them, not one. Okay, So our world starts with two things. The empty black box, just an ordinary box, and its anti-object denoted in red. It's a red box. So we'll refer to this first one as zero, and we'll refer to the second one, the red one, as anti-zero or A0, consistent with our notation. And when we write it numerically, we'll write just an ordinary zero for this black one and a zero with an A superscript for the anti-zero or A zero. And both of these together will be included in this type called capital zero. Okay, So when we talk about a capital zero, we could be either talking about this zero here, this black one, or this anti-zero here, this red one. Okay, what can we do with just zeros? Well, we can add them. Now, when we were just talking about M sets before, we just had empty M sets, and then it was obvious that the empty M set plus the empty M set was the empty M set. But now things are a little bit more complicated because we have these two kinds of fundamental zero objects. So we have to specify the addition for uh, all possible pairs. So uh, a black empty box, plus a black empty box is another black empty box. And similarly, a red anti-zero plus a red anti-zero is a black box or a zero. And otherwise, black plus red equals red, 
and red plus black equals red. So we could say this also in the language of zeros and anti-zeros. So zero plus zero is zero. Zero plus anti-zero is anti-zero. Uh, anti-zero plus zero is anti-zero, and anti-zero plus anti-zero is zero. So this is a pretty fundamental kind of thing, and we justify this because we want the the arithmetic uh, that we are going to create to be somewhat consistent, okay? And, um, and so this is a good way to proceed. Okay, now we can extend this consistently to sums of more boxes or anti-boxes, in this case just zero boxes. So for example, if we have uh, an anti-zero and a zero and a zero and a zero and an anti-zero and an anti-zero and we add them all up, okay, so then we can do it in, in a number of ways. But we can just think about really what, what's crucial is the number of anti-zeros. So that's going to determine the, the the type of the resulting thing. In this case, there's an odd number of red ones or an odd number of anti-zeros, so the result is going to be another anti-zero, zero anti. So the sum depends only on the parity of the number of anti-boxes. If there are an even number of anti-boxes, then the result is zero, while if there are an odd number of anti-boxes, then the result is anti-zero. Okay, so now we're going to define recursively the um, what a box is, what a capital B box is. And we're going to start. The initial objects are the two zero boxes, the, the zero box and the anti-zero box. Okay, and we declare that these are both capital B boxes. Okay, and then there's only one more thing, which is a kind of an inductive definition. So we agree that if we have x, y up to say z, these are already defined boxes, capital B boxes, then we'll agree that so are these two things, the black box containing X and Y and so on up to Z, call it A, and the anti of that object, which is a red box containing exactly the same elements, containing X, Y, up to Z. Okay, so this thing here is a box because it's black, this thing is an anti box because it's red, and these are antis of each other because the contents are otherwise exactly the same. The only difference between these two is the color of the bounding box. Okay, and just a little bit of additional notation. We'll say that in this case, x, y, up to z, these are the elements of the capital B boxes A or anti-A. So this is really the, the story of the objects that we're going to be considering. We're just going to create recursively more and more complicated boxes, capital B boxes, by recursively creating boxes, by nesting them. And once we have nested boxes, then we can use those as elements of further nested boxes. And that's, that's what our arithmetic is going to consist of. And that's... Uh, going to be a much wider and bigger arithmetic than we currently have. Okay, much wider and bigger. Now, I want to distinguish or introduce some notation to distinguish these two types of capital B boxes. So we'll say that a, a box is a capital box of positive type. And we'll denote the positive type by this particular symbol, like a plus sign with a circle around it, okay? Not to be confused with addition. So this is just a symbol denoting this positive type, which is um, associated to a, a box, that is something that's got black around it. Similarly, an anti-box or a box is a capital box of negative type. It will be denoted by a minus sign. This is not a theta, it's a minus sign enclosed in a circle. Okay, so these are the two possible types of a capital box. You have a capital box, you can ask, is it either a positive type or of negative type? And to tell, you just look at the color of the outside box. If it's black, then it's positive. If it's red, it's negative, independent of what's inside. Okay, so then we can express this uh, summation of zeros this aspect of counting the number of 
antiboxes by saying that the sum of zeros is a zero again, whose type is the product of the types of the constituents. Okay. Well, so we have to define what we mean by a product of types, and that's sort of the obvious thing. So we'll agree that positive times positive is positive, negative times negative is positive, positive times negative is negative, and negative times positive is positive. So that's just the same as it is in ordinary life. Okay, so that's how we can say um, how to determine the, the type of a uh, sum of, of, of zeros, let's say but in fact of more general boxes. So for example here, uh, here we've got three black boxes and three red boxes. These are the corresponding types underneath, the plus or positive type, positive type, negative type, positive type, negative type, negative type. To determine the type of the sum, okay, which is going to be another zero, but what kind of zero, what type of zero, we just form the product of all these types. Okay, and well, that's going to be negative type because there's an odd number of negatives. So you get a negative, and that means that the resulting sum is an anti box or anti zero in red. Okay, the crucial annihilation creation sort of property that we, we insist that objects and anti objects have is that if we have a box, capital B, and it's anti box. B A, B super A or anti B. If they both occur in a box M, capital B box M, okay, then they mutually annihilate each other. This means that they both disappear. They both disappear. That's the crucial relation that we have between boxes and their antis. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So here is a box. It has two elements in it. And these elements are antis of each other because the contents are exactly the same. There's two red boxes inside them, but one's black and one's red. So these are antis of each other. That means they mutually annihilate, and the result is an empty box or a zero. Here is a red box. It has three um, elements inside. Two are these red boxes, and here's a black one. The contents of all three are the same. So this first red box, for example, this is an anti box. It's the anti of this, this box here because the contents are the same. There's two black boxes inside them. So these are opposites or antis. They're going to mutually annihilate each other. They're going to disappear, and we're just going to end up with this remaining uh, fellow. So we end up with this uh, red box with a red box inside and two black boxes inside it. Over here, we've got a black box with uh, four elements inside, and um, there is some cancellation because inside this first box, there's a a zero and uh, an anti-zero, and they're going to then mutually annihilate each other. So we're just going to get a an, an empty uh, box there for that one there. And over here, this one here and this one here are antis of each other because the contents are the same. There's two red boxes in each of them, but one's black on the outside, the other one's red on the outside. So these are antis. They're going to mutually annihilate each other. Poof, they're gone. So that just leaves us with this uh, red one down here in the corner additionally. But now we have a black box, an empty box, and here's a red version of that. So this is zero, this is anti-zero. They mutually annihilate each other. There's nothing there left, and we just end up with a single empty box. So the, the resulting thing is zero. Okay. So now we can introduce natural numbers and then integers. So uh, a natural number, first of all, is a box of zeros. Okay, now notice there's it's a, it's a small b box. That means we're talking about a black thing, okay? And it's a small z zero. That means we're talking about an empty black box. So it's a box consisting of a lot of empty black boxes. That's a natural number. So aside from zero, the fundamental new natural number is this one here. It's a black box with a single black box inside it. That's the number one. So in our world, that is the number one.
But we have other things which are also natural numbers. For example, this thing here is the number four, what we usually call the number four. And this thing here is also a natural number because it's also a box of zeros. It's a box that has no zeros in it, but nevertheless, it's still a box of zeros. And so that's zero. So zero also is counted as a natural number. Now, a big departure from usual arithmetic, an a natural number. Okay, just consistent with our notation, to get the ante of something, we just stick an A with a hyphen in front of it. So an A natural number is an anti-box of zeros. Okay, so for example here, for ante, there's four black boxes inside, a red box. So this is the ante of the four above here. And the ante of this thing is zero ante. So these are both... Uh, anti-natural numbers, okay? So we got these two types, little nat, little n nat, and a little n nat. And now a natural number with a capital N, so a capital natural number, is either a natural number or an a natural number. So we're going to enlarge the view of what a natural number is at least when it has a capital in front. So the use of the capital is, yes, indeed, uh, rather crucial here to keep the distinctions that we want. Okay, So the, the capital N nat is now a type that includes both natural numbers and their antis. Okay, these anti-natural numbers, these are objects which are not found in traditional mathematics. We've been doing mathematics for thousands and thousands of years. And I think this is really the first time where we have anti-natural numbers. And I'm claiming that they are actually playing a very important, even crucial role in our arithmetic. Okay, and to bring that to the fore, we introduce the idea of an integer. An integer, without a capital, is a box of capital zeros. It's a box of capital zero, so that means it's a, it's a box, it means it's black, but the elements in it can be either zeros or anti-zeros. An A integer is an anti-box, or an A box, of capital zeros. So it's, again, a box, but now a red box consisting of a whole bunch of zeros, and the zeros are capital zeros, so they could be either empty black boxes or empty red boxes. So we have these two type, little i int and a int. And now, consistent with before, we'll define a capital i integer, capital integer, is either an integer or an anti-integer. And we'll introduce int now to refer to either integers or anti-integers. So, for example, this thing here is a natural number, but it's also an integer. It's a box of zeros. This is actually a little i integer. This thing here is an a integer. It's a red box consisting of zeros. This thing here is a black box also consisting of of capital zeros. So this is another uh, integer. This is what we would normally call minus three. This is what we call three. This thing here, we don't have a traditional name for it, so we have to make up a new name. This is three ante. The ante of this thing, we also don't have a traditional name of. Here's what it looks like. So this would be minus three ante or three bar ante. These are all examples of capital I integers. Right. Okay, so addition of boxes, this fundamental operation, okay, which at the multiset level we've seen is absolutely fundamental. This is what distinguishes the data structure of multisets from all the other ones, is that multisets support this most elementary of operations, the addition, where you just dump stuff out into another box. So we're doing very much the same thing here, but we have to just be a little bit more careful, a little bit more subtle, because we have to keep in mind the colors of the boxes, either black or red. 
So to add capital boxes, what are we going to do? We're going to form a new capital box whose elements are all the elements of the original capital boxes and whose type is the product of the types of the original capital boxes. So we're going to do just as we did before. We take the contents of all these capital boxes. That means they could be boxes or anti-boxes. The outsides could be black or red. And we're going to dump them all out. Okay, the, the elements all get put into another box. But the color of that new box now has to be determined. It's determined by the color of all the various original boxes that we are taking the stuff, dumping out of. Okay, So we have to take the product of the types of the original boxes to determine the type uh, or the color of the final box. So, for example, here we're adding these three boxes, all right? So, first what we do is we just take the elements and dump them out into a box. So, these two guys here get copied there, uh, these two guys here are copied down here, and these guys here are copied here. Okay. And then we put this in a box, but we have to determine what's the color of this bounding box. So we go up to here and we say, okay, these are type, well, this is this is of negative type, this is positive type, this is positive type. So the product of those types is negative. That's why we have a red bounding box. But there is some simplification possible here because this thing here and this one here are antis of each other. So they're going to cancel. Okay, and also this zero and this anti-zero are also going to cancel. So we're just going to be left with this object here and this one here. So we get an anti-box overall since negative times positive times positive is negative. And we note that the sum of natural numbers is also a natural number. And the sum of capital integers is also a capital integer. We get, however, an A integer if there's an odd number of A integers in the sum, and otherwise we get an integer. Okay, now we have a, a result that we can uh, convince ourselves of, that in, in this great generality of addition of, of arbitrary capital boxes, that it's actually commutative and it's associative. Now I can talk about the multiplication of capital boxes. So to form the product A times B of capital boxes A and B, we take the capital box of all possible sums A plus B, or little a plus little b, where little a belongs to A, in other words, is an element of A, and little b is an element of B. And of course, we have to take each element with the corresponding uh, multiplicity. That is, we're going to take each element no matter how many times the similar kind of thing appears. Where the type of A times B, so the resulting type of this, this big box, is the product of the types of A and B. So it's the same rule as we used for addition of boxes, also for multiplication. So in terms of a special case, the special case is just the products of zeros, of capital zeros. And that multiplication table is just like the addition multiplication table. So 0 times 0 is 0, 0 times anti-zero is anti-zero, anti-zero times 0 is anti-zero, and anti-zero times anti-zero is 0. And I remind you that we had justification, we had good reason for defining things this way. But curiously, it is a table which is identical to the addition table for capital zeros. And, of course, we notice, as we have before, that there are some curiosities about this, maybe even some disconcerting aspects. In particular, this property that 0 times anti-zero is anti-zero. That's disconcerting because it's different from the familiar rule that 0 times anything is 0. Right? That's a rule that we're used to for any A. But this does not hold here. It holds much of the time, but it does not hold when capital A is an anti-zero. In that case, the right-hand side is not zero, it is rather anti-zero. 
Okay, and here's an example. So here's a, a box A, and here's an anti-box B. Okay, the roof is missing there. There it is there. Okay, and so to take their product, what do we do? Well, we have to take all possible sums. So we start with this one here, maybe this, this box here, plus this one here, and then this one plus this one, and this one plus this one. So this first row, we're adding this empty box to each one of these three. And so now for the second row, the second element here, first of all, we'll add it to this thing, and then add it to this one, and then add it to this one. We get these guys here. And so now we have to evaluate these by our prior notion of addition. So we do that. Um, so adding zero to something doesn't change it. So we get uh, just this thing here, this thing here, this thing here. And then when we do the sum here, okay, here we have summation. So we're going to get uh, three black boxes inside, but the outside is going to be black because negative times negative is positive. Over here, we have negative times positive. So we're going to get an anti-box with three things inside. And uh, is that right? With three things inside? No, not with three things inside. That should actually be two things inside, shouldn't it? Um, because we're just adding this thing here to that. Yes, so pardon me. Um, this thing here uh, should be eliminated. It's just a red box with two black boxes inside it. And lastly, this thing here, have I done that one right? Um, we've got four black boxes, yes, and the type of the bounding box is a negative, so it's in red. Okay, so it's almost correct a calculation of A times B. And then we have a theorem that multiplication of boxes is also commutative and associative. Now that we have both addition and multiplication of general boxes, we can ask about how they relate. To what extent does the distributive law, which is this thing here, hold? That A plus B times C should be A times C plus B times C. Okay, so we've already observed that the distributive law doesn't always hold. And that's evident even just at the level of the zeros, the capital zeros. Because if we have a zero plus an anti-zero, and we multiply it by anti-zero, then zero plus anti-zero is anti-zero. So we get anti-zero times anti-zero, which is zero. On the other hand, the distributive law asks us to calculate zero times anti-zero plus anti-zero times anti-zero. This thing here is anti-zero. This thing here is zero. And their sum is anti-zero. So the distributive law does not hold generally. That's a little bit disconcerting, but it's actually not that bad when we realize that we have the following result, that the distributive law actually holds for A, B, and C boxes. That is, they're black things, okay? So I'm going to just show you why that is. So in considerable generality, suppose that our three boxes are say, A, B, and C. And A has, say, elements X, Y up to Z. B has elements K, L up to M. And C has elements P, Q up to R. Okay. Then when we calculate A plus B times C, so there's A plus B, just the, the sum of the two uh, M sets, and it's going to be black, okay, times C here, C. Oops, the roof is up here. Um, so what we're going to get is we're going to get the, the M set of all possible sums. And since it's black times black, we're going to get black. Okay, So it's positive times positive is going to be positive. So we're going to get elements uh, X plus P, X plus Q, up to X plus R, and then Y plus P, Y plus Q, up to Y plus R, and then uh, uh, Z plus P, all the way up to Z plus P, Z plus Q, Z plus R. That's from that top row. And then down here, K plus P, K plus Q, up to K plus R, L plus P, L plus Q, up to L plus R, all the way up to M plus P, M plus Q, up to M plus R. On the other hand, when we look at the other side of the distributive law, A times C plus B times C, so here's, here they are again, okay, so we have to look at A times C plus B times C, then what do we get? Well, here's A times C, so X plus P, 
x plus q all the way up to x plus r, then y plus p, y plus q up to y plus r, all the way up to z plus p, z plus q up to z plus r, and something similar for b times c. And then when you look at these things and compare their sum with uh, this, you see that you're getting exactly the same elements. Okay, so yes indeed, we do get uh, a plus b times c. So things work uh, because everything is in black and so the black times black is just is black. Okay, so we see that the, the problem with the distributive law is not really a deep problem, it's just a sort of a, a surface problem having to do with the color of that outside box. Okay, so now let's go to poly numbers, okay, which is um, actually sort of where most algebra takes place. Okay, but now we have this sort of enlarged point of view. So, first of all, a definition. A poly number, or poly, is a box of capital integers. A box, so it's black. Okay, that's a small poly. That's a type. An anti-poly number, or a poly, is an a box of capital integers. That's type a poly there. Okay, so then a capital poly number or a capital poly is either a poly or an anti-poly. And we have the type capital poly. So this is a little bit different because formally we call these things integral poly numbers. So roughly speaking, I want to elevate integer arithmetic. That's sort of the, uh, the nicest arithmetic in some sense, okay? And so our polys are going to be associated with integer arithmetic. That's sort of really nice algebra. So for example, the fundamental new poly that we get, okay, this alpha thing, is where we have a, a box inside a box inside a box. And what's inside here is the number one. So this is a box containing one. Alpha squared will then be the, the square of this thing. So we have to multiply this thing with itself. That means we have to make a box whose element is the sum of this thing and this thing. So when we add these two things here, we're getting one plus one, which is two. So we're getting the, the, uh, the box, which has a single two in it, and so on. Alpha cubed will be the box containing a single three, etc. So for example, we can combine these things. So this thing here, it's a box. It's got a zero there, a zero there, a three there. So this thing is two plus alpha cubed. But in the world of poly, there are now more possibilities because these examples are all just black things, but we can have black things and red things. So in particular, this thing here is of interest. So, so we have a black box which contains a red box which contains a black box. So this is minus alpha or our preferred notation alpha bar. Why is that? Well, because if you take alpha, which is this, and you add it to this thing, when you add these, you're going to get a black box with this thing inside it and this thing inside it, but these are antis of each other, so they cancel and you're just going to get zero. Another possibility is this thing here, which is a black box containing a black box containing a red box. That's alpha to the minus one. Or um, another way of looking at it, it's uh, the box containing minus one or one bar. And why is that? Well, because if we multiply alpha, there's alpha, with this, this object, okay, then what we have to do is we have to form the box, because we're taking the product of two boxes, of this box here and this box here. So now when we add these two things, okay, when we add these two things, well, the contents will annihilate each other and we're just going to get an empty box, which is one. So that's why this thing deserves to be called alpha to the minus one, because when we multiply it by alpha, we get one or alpha to the zero. And you can check that uh, another possibility is to take a black box containing a red box containing a red box. That's minus alpha to the minus one. So um, that's just sort of the start of polynomial arithmetic, but it's, as we've seen before, um, in some sense, a, a bigger arithmetic than usual because of the existence of these negative powers of alpha playing essentially just as important a role as positive powers. So this is a bit of a departure from the calculus point of view towards polynomials. It's a bigger picture.
And very briefly, then, of course, the next stage up, there's a whole hierarchy of, of stages, or maybe we should say the next stage down, are those multi-numbers, okay? And similarly, we can define a multi-number or a multi, that should be a multi, um, is a box of capital polys. Well, an A multi-number or an A multi is an A box of capital polys. And then a capital multi-number or a capital multi is either a multi or an anti-multi, and we have this new type. And this, this world here is something of a new world. We haven't explored it very much, okay? But there will be some interesting twists uh, in, in this, in this multi-number world, as we'll see. But we can see this you know, entire chasm of, of arithmetic below us. So we're just at the top rungs with the usual algebra, polynomial algebra. And, you know, there's this vast chasm underneath us uh, with all kinds of complexity because these things can be, can be uh, you know, uh, layered and we could get blacks and reds uh, layering in all kinds of interesting ways. And we should expect that the behavior of these objects depends sort of on the, the relative uh, colorings of these various nested layers. Uh, so in principle, this is a, a huge and, and, and maybe sort of almost mind-blowing arithmetic that we have in front of us. Um, but lots to explore. And of course, the uh, crucial question is, you know, is this, the, is this the arithmetic of the world? I'm Norman Walberger. Thanks for listening.